We're now going to turn to look at what factors underlie the position of peaks in diffraction data. First of all, though, we need to discuss the two different types of X-ray scattering. Incoherent scattering arises from the interaction of X-rays with loosely bound or free electrons. It's an inelastic event, meaning the energy of incident and scattered X-rays is different, and there's no phase relationship between the two. Coherent scattering arises from the interaction of X-rays with bound electrons. Coherent scattering is an elastic event, meaning that there's no change in energy between the incidents and scattered X-rays, and a definite phase relationship exists between the two as well. Diffraction arises from coherent scattering. So what do we mean by phase relationship? There's a good simulation from this, which you can see linked here to the Salford University website. And this gives you a tool where you can play around with this yourself. I've taken two screen captures here, showing out-of-phase and in-phase waves. On the left-hand side, we have two waves which are out-of-phase. You can see that wave 1 has peaks at positions where wave 2 has troughs. And when we combine the two, we get complete destructive interference. On the right-hand side, we have two waves that are in-phase, so the peaks and troughs are coincident. And when we combine these, we get a wave with a bigger amplitude, so the two waves have constructively interfered. And this is the process that underpins diffraction. If we imagine that we've got a crystal with two lattice planes, as shown here on the right, running parallel to a free surface, we can imagine the conditions that might be required for diffraction to occur. So we've got a red wave being diffracted off an atom in the first plane, and then a purple X-ray being diffracted uh, from the next plane down. And you can see that for these waves to be in phase when they're scattered, uh, the, the purple wave is going to have to travel an extra distance, A, B, C, that is equal to an integer number of wavelengths, N lambda. We, for, by simple geometry, we can see that this distance, A, B, C, is equal to 2 A, B, and that by simple geometry, AB must equal D, that is the spacing between the two planes, multiplied by sine theta, where theta is the angle of reflection. Therefore, our path length difference delta must equal 2D sine theta. And this gives rise to Bragg's law, N lambda equals 2D sine theta. Now these lattice planes don't really exist, but it's very easy to imagine them running through crystalline material. If we take the example of Roxol here, sodium chloride, it's very easy for us to see planes of atoms running in the horizontal direction as indicated by the orange lines, and in this case these are separated by some distance which we can call E1. We can easily imagine planes of atoms running in alternative directions as well, such as that indicated here in purple with its spacing E2. And you'll note that the despacing of these two planes D1 and D2 are not equal. So these, the, the spacing of these planes is very characteristic of the particular crystal structure. We can label lattice planes using a numeric system called Miller indices. Usually these are three integer numbers, generically referred to as HKL values. The Miller indices of a lattice plane specify its orientation, but not its absolute position. And they come from the reciprocals of intersections on the unicell edge of the plane adjacent to the origin. Let's see what that actually means. Imagine on the right here that we've got a set of lattice planes running through this crystal structure. And we've identified what the unicell is, what the smallest repeating motif or, or building block of the crystal is. Firstly, we need to identify the plane which is adjacent to the origin, and that's indicated here with the blue arrow. Next, we need to find where this plane intersects in A. C. And you can see that the intercept is halfway along A, so it's at one half. It intersects B at the corner, so one, and about a third of the way up C, so we'll call that one third. So the intercepts are a half, one, one third. We then take the reciprocals of those numbers. So the reciprocal of a half is two, of one is one, and one third is three. So the reciprocals are two, one, three. And that means that the plane indicated is therefore the 213 plane. 
we can use Bragg's law to predict the direction of diffractive cubes from sets of lattice planes. So we could work out the despacing of that 2, 1, 3 plane and substitute it into Bragg's law as D. That would tell us the angles at which x-rays will be diffracted from that plane. So you can see that the angle is uh, determined by the distance between parallel planes of atoms. So if we measure the angles at which the diffracted peaks are observed, we get a diffraction pattern that's very characteristic of a material. And experimentally, this is the basis of X-ray diffraction. The most basic application of this phenomenon is in uh, phase analysis, which is basically a fingerprinting technique. And that means we're going to try and match the positions of the peaks and also the relative intensities uh, against databases of known reference materials. For our phase analysis here in Sheffield, we tend to use software called PDF4+, Plus, which is made by the International Centre for Diffraction Data, a not-for-profit charity uh, based in the US. You can see training videos of me using the software and instructional material uh, on the MOL website as well. Some examples of this, well, here we have three different polymorphs of TiO2, rutile in black, anatase in, green, in red, and the high-pressure brookite phase in green. And you can see that in each case the crystal structure is different, and accordingly they produce very different diffraction patterns. So if you were to happen to pick up a, a jar labeled TiO2 filled with white powder, you would be able to do an XRD pattern and compare against these, and work out what polymorph of TiO2 the jar actually contained. Similarly, if we look at silica, we can see that the alpha and beta quartz polymorphs of silica have very similar diffraction patterns, just some subtle changes here and there, the smaller reflections. And this is because the crystal structures are very similar for these two. Low crystobolite and high crystobolite have different crystal structures, and you can see the diffraction patterns for these look quite different. At the top, we have a diffraction pattern from some silica glass. And we can see simply here um, a broad amorphous hump centered around about 25 degrees to a beta, and no strong, narrow Bragg reflections, indicating that this material is in fact a glass and amorphous material and that there's no long range order. Once we know the positions of peaks, it's also easy for us to calculate the dimensions of the unit itself, that is, the lattice parameters. There are a whole number of equations that link the lattice planes, i.e. the Miller indices for a given plane and the despacing for that plane, with the unit cell dimensions. For example, for a cubic system, 1 over d squared equals h squared plus k squared plus l squared, all over a squared. We can use this equation to calculate the lattice uh, parameters for a cubic system, given only the despacing of a single Bragg reflection. And there's also shortcuts, obviously, if we know that a peak is a reflection from a 1, 0, 0 plane, 1 over d squared equals 1 squared over a squared simplifies to give us a equals d. And we can see for tetragonal, or thorhombic, hexagonal, monoclinic, and triclinic systems, these equations grow uh, increasingly more complex. But certainly for a cubic through to hexagonal, it's very easy to work out these spacings and lattice parameters by hand, simply from an understanding of the H, K, and L values. Let's take a look at this in action. And so here we have um, iron, which has a, a body-centered cubic crystal structure with a lattice parameter of about 2.865 angstroms. We can use the equation we saw a moment ago to work out the spacing of 100 planes. So we take again 1 over d squared equals h squared plus k squared plus l squared over a squared for a cubic system. We substitute in the Miller indices into this and the lattice parameter, and we can work out that the d spacing for um, a 110 reflection from iron body centered cubic is about 2.026 angstroms. We can then use Bragg's law to predict the position of that reflection in the diffraction pattern. So if we take um, the X-rays as having a wavelength of copper K alpha 1 radiation, 1.5406 angstroms, we can substitute that in as lambda. We almost always take the order of, of reflection N to equal 1 when we're doing an XRD work. 
So we can easily substitute the values in there and work out um, that the peak would occur at 44.69 degrees to theta in our diffraction pattern. We can also uh, manually index diffraction patterns. So coming to the problem from a different angle, we need to assign then HKL values to the observed peaks. And it's very easy to do this for simple cases like cubic symmetry using a method called the sine squared theta method. And you can see a video of me doing this on MOL. For more complex systems, you might want to use software. And certainly for the very complex systems, if we're going to index the pattern en route to working out the lattice parameters perhaps, then we're certainly going to want to use software to do that. Again, there will be uh, tutorial videos and guided instructions for me doing that on MOL, which you can download for your own use. But hopefully this has given you an idea for the factors that underlie uh, peak position and diffraction patterns. The only thing uh, that comes into play is the, um, the, the crystal structure. So the peak positions and diffraction data are only influenced by um, the crystal structure and the space in between the plates. Providing you avoid instrumental aberrations like specimen height displacement, all you need to know to get to lattice parameters is the peak positions 